that we are still more afraid of the usual suspects, even though the usual suspects cannot do one one hundredth of the damage of the not so usual suspects, whose actions actually are far more contributory to our current situation and the global situation. So that wealth disparity's got nothing to do with merit, talent, intelligence, hard work, or investment strategies. It has to do with the fact that some folks had a head start, and that head start doesn't go away just because you pass the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Act. In fact, let's understand the real basis of that stuff because this is clear that some, some people are confused about right now. Particularly these folks who keep yelling and screaming about how they don't want the government intervening in the economy. They don't want the government intervening in health care. And they don't want the government to manage it. They just want the market to control everything. They just want small government. See, that, that's precious. Coming from people who never objected to big government when it was creating white wealth. When it was creating the white middle class, make no mistake, but that is what did it. Wasn't hard work and initiative in some vacuum, because most people in a competitive society have to work hard at least same. So that sort of goes without saying. White, black, brown doesn't matter. People tend to work hard and do so in relatively similar numbers. But what did matter is that the government of the United States stepped in and created wealth for white folks. Big government did that. We need to understand that's where the head start comes from. And this thing goes back an awful long way. It actually goes back to the colonies. In the 1630s and 1640s, there was a program in place. My family actually took advantage of it when one of the branches came during that period. You may or may not have heard about it. Odds are not, because we don't talk about it in school. But it was this thing called the Head Rights Program. The Head Rights Program was a program that allowed male heads of households from England who came to the United States to claim 50 acres of land and the tools with which to work it for nothing, just for making the trip. Now, you see, you give out 50 acres of land and some tools to black people, and we call that a handout. We call that welfare. We might even call that reparations. You give out 50 acres of land and some tools to white folks, we call it nation building. See how that works? Fascinating, the different kind of rhetoric that we use. Millions of acres of land were given out that way over a period of a very short period of time. Fast forward to the 1860s. Homestead Act of 1862 gets passed. What does it do? It gives out 240 million or more acres of land for virtually nothing for white families. People of color almost completely barred from being able to take advantage of it. 240 million acres of virtually free land. The free market can't do that. Let's just at least agree on that. The small government can't do that. The market cannot take other people's land and give it to you. Right? Only a very large government with guns is capable of doing that. And that's what happened, of course, because this had been somebody else's land before, and then it got taken and redistributed. And yet what's interesting is I haven't seen a single one of the families, because there are 20 million white folks in this country today, some estimate as many as 50 million, but at least 20 million, who are living who are the direct descendants of those people who got homestead out benefits, many millions of them living on that land, living on those ranches, living on those farms, living in those houses. Not one of them has showed up in Washington, D.C. and said, you know what, I've got to give this back, because uh, it seems to me that if I keep this... This property that the government made possible, that'd be like, um, what would that be like? What's the word? That'd be like socialism. <laughs> so here, y'all can take this back, because I didn't get it fair and square, you see, but no one does that. Fast forward to the 20th century, not even the early 20th, the middle. So we're talking about the lifetimes of people in this room, and for others of you, certainly the lifetimes of your parents and grandparents. Right? From the 1930s to the 1960s, the first 30 years of the Federal Housing Administration Home Loan Program added to that, the VA Home Loan Program added to that in the 1940s. What were these? These were government-created programs to subsidize indirectly by way of guaranteeing with taxpayer dollars private loans from banks. Prior to the creation of the FHA, banks would not lend money to working-class people. It didn't matter what color you were. They just didn't want to do it because the risk was too great. So even if you were white, didn't matter. If you didn't have enough to pay like half the down payment up front and you could pay it off in 10 years, you weren't getting a mortgage. That was the way it worked. The government steps in. There was no middle class. I mean, there just wasn't any. The government steps in, creates the FHA program, later the VA program. What do these do? They basically say, don't worry if the borrowers default, right, it'll be backed up by the full faith and credit of the United States Treasury, which is to say the taxpayers of the United States, so you'll get your money back or at least some portion of it. And that made the banks willing to lend to lower income and working class white families who previously would have had to rent just like black and brown families. They wouldn't have been able to buy. But the problem was the FHA, which now is like a universal, a lot of you when you get your first home will probably get an FHA loan. That's what you do. It's low interest, the terms are good, you know, you don't have to have a lot down, that kind of thing. But in the first 30 years of that program, it was almost exclusively for white because the underwriting criteria that the banks were using that was actually given to them by a quasi-public institution Right, known as the Home Ownership Lending Corporation, which was created during this period. The underwriting criteria that they used basically made it impossible for people of color to get these loans, even though they were guaranteed with taxpayer
taxpayer money, including the money of black and brown taxpayers. But the way the criteria was written, 98% of all the loans went to white families. By 1960, 40% of all white family mortgages were being written under this one preferential policy. Government policy, $120 billion worth of housing equity loans from the early 1940s, late 30s, until the early 1960s that Italian people of color couldn't get in on that. $120 billion head start. And again, if you do that for people of color, that's affirmative action, that's racial preference, that's welfare, that's a handout. You do it for white folks, it's good macroeconomic policy. Right? And of course, it was good macroeconomic policy. It would have been even better had it been extended to people of color because you'd have had an even bigger economic stimulus, but they weren't thinking in those terms. So you have the FHA, the VA program, even black and brown veterans excluded from the loans that were available under the VA program. You have the GI Bill, which in theory was available to all returning veterans after World War II in Korea, but in practice, the disproportionate benefits went to white veterans because if you were a veteran of color, the employer, you know, theoretically what the GI Bill did, said, said you could get training. Uh, you know, to have a job, you could go to college, you know, you get these opportunities, but the employers still had the right of refusal. They still had the right to not hire you, to discriminate against you on the basis of race. Their property rights as owners were given precedence over the right of those returning GIs to have jobs. You couldn't just go to any college if they didn't want to admit you, so people of color were still excluded even after they had served the country in the military. So you have all of these programs, Homestead Act, VA, FHA, GI Bill, all the way back to the head white system, all these things pumping literally hundreds of billions, one might say trillions of dollars worth of wealth into white folks' hands before people of color even got the starting gate of wealth accumulation by the time the Fair Housing Act came about. And if you know anything about the Fair Housing Act, which wasn't even passed until 1968, you know that for the first 20 years, neither Democrats or Republicans thought it was important to put enforcement mechanisms in. So there weren't even any enforcement mechanisms until 88. Right? I mean, so 20 years, it's on the books. It doesn't mean anything. And even now, we know that there's evidence of discrimination. I'll speak to that in a second. But the point here being, that's why I find it so interesting when those folks in the Tea Party and all this stuff that are angry about health care talk about they want their country back the way it used to be when government was small. What date was that? Because government was never small for white people. Never was it small. Taxes were not lower back in the day. Our taxes were, top tax rate in 1958 was 91%. And it's less than half that now. Whether you think it should be even lower, let's not pretend that we want to go back to the way it was when taxes were low. Taxes were higher. Government was just as big. And white folks didn't mind it when we were the only ones getting benefits. It's only when people of color started to gain access to other programs, which aren't even as generous as the ones we had access to, that all of a sudden we discovered our inner libertarian. Right? All of a sudden we discovered our inner love of the free market. We didn't care about that before. Right? When the New Deal was passed, people of color were excluded from almost all the programs. Social Security for the first 20 years basically excluded 8 out of 10 black folks because it said you couldn't get in on Social Security if you were an agricultural laborer or a domestic worker, which was like three-quarters, 80% of all black folks in the country. And that was done at the behest of Southern Democrats who made FDR work that into the New Deal legislation in order for them to vote for it. They just want to make sure black folks didn't get in on the government program. They didn't mind government programs. They just didn't want people of color getting in. So that's the history of how wealth was created and not. That's the legacy that we have inherited. But of course, if it were just about the past, maybe we could just teach that in a history class and be done. You know, if it was just, even the, the legacy part, we could say, yeah, you know, you're right, but gosh, I mean, at least now we're over. You know, at least now we moved on. So yeah, we got to deal with all that residue, but at least now we don't have anything contributing more to inequality, new stuff. But of course we do. None of what I've just said, for example, changed on the 5th of November of 2008, the day after the presidential election. Right? None of it changed on the 21st of January 2009, just because a man of color was elected president. Yet a lot of people think that's true. The Wall Street Journal, the day after the election, said we're a post-racial nation, and Obama's just let everybody know that. Of course, the Wall Street Journal has never thought we had a race problem in this country. Never once did they editorialize about it, even when it was blatant. So you can take whatever they say with a grain of salt on pretty much any subject. Right? Um, but they also thought derivatives were great, but what I'll just not so I wouldn't really count on them for much. Right. But it wasn't just conservatives. That's easy, right? It was also some liberal folks. It was Richard Cohen, a nominally liberal columnist at the Washington Post, Frank Rich, a nominally liberal columnist at the New York Times, both of which wrote similar articles in the week leading up to the election or Cohen on the day of the election, but the post hasn't even been counted yet. See, I've learned, you know, you don't assume you know who won the presidency for like three months. If you're smart, you have to stick around and wait because you just never know how things are going to shake out. But Richard Cohen was so confident on the day of the election that he said, we have overcome. Fascinating. You actually jack civil rights language 
Right. And we, like, like as if that was part of the civil rights agenda, getting a black president. That wasn't even on the top 100 things that the movement was fighting for. It wasn't even in the, in the rear view mirror. It wasn't even on the agenda. But a lot of people seem to think that the election of a man of color as president somehow suggests that we're post-racial. Before we get into the specifics of why this is so crazy and so flawed, I just want you to think about it logically for a minute. You know, that is important. I'm going to give you some that I think demonstrate the fallacy of it. But let's just think about it logically. Why would we think that individual accomplishment, even at that level, signifies larger systemic change? Because that's what people say. How can we be a racist country anymore if a man of color can be elected president? I don't know. How did Benazir Bhutto win in Pakistan? Is it because sexism is dead? Right? A woman, she won not once but twice, 88 and 91. Now, she can't try to come back into politics, and they killed her. That's how much they love her. Right? Assassinated as she tries to return to the political field, but elected twice. As a female, if I were to say that Pakistan no longer had an issue with sexism, that patriarchal oppression had been you, you know, just eliminated in Pakistan. And this I know because Benazir Bhutto, a female, was head of state over 20 years ago, as a matter of fact. Most people, I think, would hear that and go, come on. Like, we know that girls and women in Pakistan don't have political opportunity. Same thing in India, Israel, Great Britain. They've all had female heads of state. But I don't think that anyone is going to say about any of those places that girls and women in those places are not discriminated against anymore. And yet, really, that is what we're being asked to accept in the case of our own country with regard to the subject of race. That somehow individual accomplishment says there's no longer a problem. By which logic, we should say also there was no racism in 1911 in this country. Or at least none that really was a barrier to black people. And this we know because that was the year that Madam C.J. Walker became a millionaire. The first African American and first female millionaire in this country's history. Right? She became a millionaire for those who know the story. Manufacturing and marketing, distributing, developing beauty products for black women. Cosmetics at a time when white dominated cosmetic firms didn't see the need to do this or even care about the black market. So Madam C.J. Walker moves into this opening, right, and she creates this business, and she becomes a millionaire. Fantastic. But when anyone accepts, well, Madam C.J. Walker can make it, so what the hell's wrong with all the rest of you black people? In 1911, I mean, I guess somebody could have said that, but surely we would understand how silly that was. Right? Surely we would understand that individual accomplishment, even at a level like that, doesn't necessarily tell you anything about larger systemic change. So what is the evidence? Well, the evidence is, and this is from the Labor Department just last December, that black college graduates, just to give you an idea of the ongoing disparity, and then we'll talk about the causes of that, that black college graduates twice as likely to be unemployed as white college graduates. Latino college graduates, two-thirds more likely to be unemployed than white college graduates. Asian Pacific American college graduates, 15% more likely to be out of work than their white counterparts. And when people of color are out of work, they also, regardless of their educational accomplishment, are out of work for longer periods, whether you're Asian American or African American, for example, on average seven to nine additional weeks out of work relative to white folks. So that's important for a couple reasons. One, it indicates that even when people of color have got similar educational qualifications, they are, they are not having the same outcomes and the same ultimate opportunities. It also goes a long way toward debunking this notion of reverse discrimination and unfair preference for people of color. Because if that were a real problem, they'd be snapping up all these folks of color. Oh my God, a black person with a college degree, gotta hire them. Latino with a college degree, gotta hire them. Asian with a college degree, gotta hire them. Listen, lack of opportunity for white people. But of course, that's not what's going on. We know a study from a few years ago confirmed that MIT and the University of Chicago. A study comes out from their econ departments. If you don't know anything about their econ departments, trust me when I tell you they are hardly leftist in orientation, the University of Chicago in particular, right? And this study comes out which finds that job applicants with white-sounding names 50% more likely to get called back for an interview than applicants with black-sounding names even when the qualifications are the same. Same years of experience, right? Same kind of education at the very same quality school. Everything indistinguishable except the names at the top, and simply being suspected of whiteness gives you a leg up. That, too, demonstrates ongoing barriers for, in this case, black folks, ongoing advantages for white folks. In fact, the study found that for a black applicant to have the same odds of getting a call back for an interview, not even guaranteed the job, just an interview itself, for a black person to have the same odds of a call back for an interview, they would have to have eight more years of experience relative to a white applicant in order to have the same odds. You had to be considerably more qualified to just have the same chance of getting your foot in the door. That's a study that comes out in 04. It's important to point that out because 2004 is also the year that Barack Obama is introduced to most of us at the Democratic National Convention, right? John Kerry's nominating convention, summer of, convention, summer of 04 in Boston. And most of us had never heard of a man before. He stands up. He's a state senator at the time running for U.S. Senator on Denmark, November. He stands up in the summer of 2004 and gives this beautiful oratory, right? First time most of us have seen him, first national speech. And in that, in, that, in that speech, he had a lot of applause lines. The one that got the biggest reaction was the one where he said, and you may remember it, it's time, go back and listen to it, it's stunning. He goes, we're not a black American. 
America and a white America and a Latino America and an Asian America. We're just the United States of America. And everybody's like, God. Because oh. it was lovely, man. It was beautiful. It was, it was poetic. It was prosaic. It was inspired. It was absolutely and utterly inaccurate. And Barack Obama is smart enough to know that it was. I don't have any doubt that he knew even if he said it, that he was saying something that was intellectually completely devoid of all substance. But it was a great applause line and made everybody feel good. That he said that the same summer that this MIT and University of Chicago study came out about the white names and the black names, which tells us that we're not united at all, that our opportunities are not equal at all. The same summer, a Justice Department report comes out that says that black and Latino males two to three times more likely than white males to be stopped and searched for drugs by cops even though white males are four times more likely to have the drugs on us on the occasions when we are searched. So we're half as likely, maybe one third as likely, to be searched, but we're four times more likely to be guilty on the occasions when we are. That is heavy information. And it certainly suggests we're not a united nation. It suggests that, in fact, we are profoundly dis, you know, that's not even a word, disunified. I'm down. We're going back to old presidential ways, but, but <laughs> make enough words. But that's the beauty of whiteness. See, I can do that. I can say disunified, and tomorrow it'll be in somebody's dictionary. Right? Because as a white person, I can just make up language, and folks will go, "That's okay, it's okay." Black person says disunified, folks will be like, "That's not a word," or whatever word I want to make up. Right? That's just the beauty of privilege. I'm just that's a little side note. But in any event, in any event, unity is not something that you have just because you say it. It's not an act of wish fulfillment. It's not like that movie with Kevin Costner, right, where he builds the baseball stadium in the back of his yard, and, he, and all those old dead white dudes come back to play, right, and he's like, if you build it, they will come. And it's like magic, right? That's not how justice happens. That's not how equity happens. It's not how unity happens. You don't just say it and then it emerges. You have to actually work at it, and we haven't finished that work. That's what the evidence says. Two to four million, depending on which number you believe. But let's just take the bottom one, the most conservative estimate. Two million cases of race-based housing discrimination against people of color every year. Folks being given mortgages at higher interest rates than they would be if they were white with the same collateral, same credit record, same occupational status, income, etc. This ends up depriving hundreds of thousands of black and brown folks every single year, if not millions, uh, literally would be millions of black folks every year, um, equity that they would otherwise amass. If you think about uh, a point, point and a half, two points on a loan, which is oftentimes what people of color are being charged above what they would if they were white right, in terms of their interest rate, over a 30-year loan period, that's a couple hundred thousand dollars in additional payments to the bank. That's a couple hundred thousand dollars less equity that you're able to develop. Think about the effect of that, not just on those families, which is obvious, right, for them to have less wealth, but it's also an effect on the overall economy because that's less money that I can, what do people do with their housing equity, right? Housing equity is really the number one way that most of our parents pay for our college. Right? In addition to whatever financial aid we're able to get, debt we're willing to go into, scholarships we're, we're lucky enough to get, the number one way that parents pay for their kids' education is to dip in to their housing equity. The way that we start businesses is often by dipping in to our housing equity. So if you've got millions of families and households of color around the country with you know, collectively tens of billions of dollars in less equity because they've been treated differentially in the housing market, that's money they can't use to pay for their kids' education. That's money that they can't use to start their own business, which would help stimulate the economy of whatever neighborhood and community they're living in. Really, the whole economy, the whole national economy. So we're talking about a, an economic effect, what, what economists call a, a multiplier effect, that goes well beyond just the community that's being ripped off, if you will, and given enough opportunity. This is stuff we need to think about, and not just people of color. It's obvious why people of color have to, because your lives and opportunities are at stake. But I want to make sure everybody in the room is white also understand that this matters or should matter to you. Because the truth of the matter is, whether or not you think it's about you, maybe it's not right now. A lot of folks didn't think the subprime mortgage thing was a problem either for them when it was only black and brown folks being hit by it and then spread. Didn't think double digit unemployment for black and brown folks was a national crisis when that was happening 20 years ago and 30 years ago and 10 years ago, even when the economy was good. And now that white folks are looking at double digit unemployment, it's like the, the sky is falling, the world is ending. But for some people, that's not new. For some people, that's been a normal condition. So we, A, we need to pay attention, because you never know when you start hitting this group over here today, it's going to come back and 